Why, the, you know, the question is sort of about beekeeping. Why do bees, you know, why do bees make honey? And um, the reason for that is visible in any uh, bees that you, bee hives that you see right now. And that is that bees do not hibernate in the summer, in the winter. They stay uh, active in the hive and they use the honey to, um, where's my PDF? Oh, it's eight megabytes, it's eight megabytes. This is a uh, real time virtual learning folks. Yes, I, I apologize. <laughs> we apologize, but it's, uh, you know, it looked great on screen, you're good to go, and then you fire it up and it's not so much. But uh, Garrett's going to spend a couple minutes trying to get you set up with the slides, but if not, he can just do it off the cuff. I'm pretty sure of it. I just heard a ding. I think, no, nope, that's not from him. Is this not? Hmm. I think really the best way to go about this is just to keep it says on the keep going on the pictures. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Well, this is disappointing, but everyone so, knows what bees look like. Don't worry about yes. it. Yes. So um, bees stay active all winter long in the hive and they uh, eat honey. And uh, the honey provides energy for them. Uh, they cluster in the center of the hive uh, and provide um, warmth by eating honey, shivering. And that metabolism actually keeps the center of the hive up to about uh, 90 degrees, 90 plus degrees, very consistently, no matter how cold it is, even during this cold snap that we've just had, uh, where things went down to um, you know, minus eight or 10 where I am, uh, in the center of that hive, they were tightly clustered, eating honey uh, and keeping their queen warm. And uh, that's how they get through the year. Uh, and that's how they, um, they, they, they survive. And that's why we, we love bees because they, we take the excess honey and harvest it. And uh, bees have been producing honey for as long as there've been bees and humans have been harvesting it almost as long as there've been humans. You think of bees as a wild creature, uh, but bees have been domesticated longer than cattle, uh, as domesticated as they are. Um, so let's talk about the biology of the honeybee. Uh, the European honeybee uh, divides into races and races are kind of analogous to breeds of dog. Uh, everyone, all the breeds have their own characteristics. Uh, when I started beekeeping years ago, the most dominant strain were Italian bees. Italian bees are generally docile, um, you know, easy to handle, and they produce a lot of honey. Uh, as uh, bees have come under stress, other bee breeds that are more resistant to diseases and uh, better suited for a cold climate such as ours, like the Carniolians and Russians have become predominant or mixed breeds. Um, and breeds tend to, bees tend to adapt themselves to local conditions. So they will, um, over time, the, the survivor bees will adapt to cold weather conditions like we have here. And uh, now we're seeing even disease resistance. So there's a big push on for beekeepers to um, take on local bred hun uh, honeybees. And uh, that's something that we encourage uh, people to do is when you're looking for bees, look for ones that are well adapted to your local condition. Um, so we're going to talk about the- oh, uh, uh, Garrett, yes? I know you're, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your uh, images aren't showing up, but could you possibly share the slides just so folks oh, can yeah. the text and take notes? That'd be awesome. Yes, I thought I was. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm kind of befuddled at the moment. Okay, we, we gotcha. And we, okay. we actually see your pictures in the sideshow. 
Really? Just keep going. Yeah. It's uh, never trust templates, I guess. Right. Yeah. So I'm, learned. I'm sorry. I will be having a word with a CCE extension. Anyway. Good for so, you. Go there are three. Director. There are three types of bees in in the hive. There's one. The most of the most important one is our queen bee. There's one per colony. If there's more than one, uh, there's bee trouble in the hive. Uh, the the queen is raised up by the other bees uh, by being fed a substance called royal jelly, which you can purchase um, in you know health food stores, etc. That has special hormones that causes her sexual organs to develop. In nature, uh, a queen bee lives for two to five years. She lays all the eggs. She predetermines the sex of the bee that's gonna come out of that uh, uh, cell uh, as she lays it. Um, and they mate once, only once in their life. And they gather enough sperm from several different uh, drones that they carry through them. And that kind of um, mixes the genetics up so that they uh, keep uh, their, their, their genetics healthy. Uh, during the queen's life, she reduces, releases a pheromone, a scent that is called queen rate. And as long as she is strong and laying eggs, that, uh, that, that substance is exuded and the bees are happy and they work. And as she weakens, as she gets older with age, the queen rate reduces uh, its power uh, she's not producing enough, and that stimulates the bees to start raising up new queen cells and requeen. Um, the workers, most bees in a good condition, uh, most hives in a good condition, uh, have more worker bees than anything else, usually 10 to 50,000 uh, worker bees per hive. Uh, the workers' bodies develop differently than the queens. Uh, they don't develop sexually. Uh, they uh, have wax glands, and uh, their appendages that are used for food gathering uh, become predominant. So they have longer tongues to reach into uh, the flowers, pollen baskets on their legs, and they have a nectar crop, a, a, a pre-stomach where they carry the nectar back to the hive. Uh, workers, when they hatch out, uh, get right to work almost immediately, and their role in the hive is determined by the age that they are. So as they move through their age, their cycle of life, they change roles. They start out as nurse bees. They uh, turn around and help the other uh, bees as they are emerging. Uh, then uh, they guard the hive. Uh, and their final stage in life is their foragers. And once they're foragers, they, in the summer, they uh, work until their wings fall off um, or they run into something that six weeks in the entire life cycle of a bee. Uh, in the winter, they live a longer life, uh, six months, um, because they're in that hive almost the entire time. Um, but they, have, they also have other tasks that they can go to or do at uh, different points in their life. It's a little bit mysterious, a lot of research that goes on trying to figure out exactly you know, what the stimuli is that starts them to build comb. Uh, or for some bees to become specialized uh, workers, like there's a class of bees, a case of bees that are undertakers that remove dead bodies from the hive. Um, but they have, they work together. They, uh, they also exude pheromones that uh, kind of tell their, their, their uh, colleagues, um, we need to produce more uh, honey because there's a bloom cycle coming in or we're running out or there's a dearth. So we need to cycle back. And this collective releasing of pheromones is one of their prime message ways of communication. The final type of bee are the drones, the male bees. Uh, they have one role in life, and that is they are the DNA carriers of the hive. They are uh, specifically built to fertilize the queen. Uh, they have no body parts or any ability or inclination to do any work besides that. So mostly they just hang out at the hive. They can't feed themselves really. The worker bees have to feed them. Uh, and then when the time comes, they, um, go, um, they go off and they, they meet queens from other hives and they, they breed and they die. Um, you can't see the picture because it isn't here, but uh, if you're to look at a picture of a, of a drone bee, I encourage you to look at the different types of bees to distinguish them. 
A drone bee is a slightly larger bodied bee with much larger eyes. That's the way you can tell a drone from a, a worker bee. And uh, also drone bees, if you look at a hive in September, uh, as the um, cycle of the year is closing up here, um, worker bees start to throw drones out of the hive. They don't carry them through the winter uh, because they have no use and they're just extra mouths to feed. So it's a kind of an interesting phenomenon to watch that happen. Uh, so this is, I won't bother with this, honeybee architecture. Um, bees in nature uh, build hives, not surprisingly, much different than humans build for them. Uh, in nature, bees prefer to be somewhat elevated, about six or 20 feet above the ground. That's where you'll see them um, in trees, sometimes in houses or barns. Uh, that provides good protection for them. They build in cavities uh, that range between volume between two and uh, 20 gallons. Uh, they tend to have entrances that are downward facing and are towards the bottom of their, their, um, their nest. So that allows them to uh, control uh, the warmth and also prevents moisture from coming in in the form of rain or snow. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a climate control. And also when they form new hives by swarming, they tend to move away from the parent colony at least a thousand feet, sometimes up to a mile away. Uh, so they're, they're establishing new territory. I mean, the, the swarm is um, the primary means of bees uh, reproducing themselves uh, as a colony. Uh, is the bees will be successful in um, gathering honey and they will fill their, 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 their hive up and as soon as it gets too hot, too crowded in there, they begin to sense that and they start to communicate with one another and they will raise up another queen and uh, a swarm takes half the bees, half the existing population out and the old queen, they go off and they find a new home and the new queen stays in the hive with the other half and you have two, uh, then two colonies. Uh, as a beekeeper, you want to control this as much as possible because when half the bees leave, it's going to cut your population down, cut your honey production down, and um, you'll have to kind of start over again. Uh, if you can capture that swarm, you can then have another colony. Uh, and as you get into beekeeping, you will find swarm catching becomes a primary activity in the months of May and June. Uh, both from your bees and you'll start to get calls from other people's bees. Uh, bees, when they are in a swarm, uh, are engorged with honey. Uh, they are, don't have a home to defend. You might see them on a signpost or a car or a fender or a branch. So they're quite docile and they're actually very easy to, to for the most part, easy to handle. Uh, and they can be introduced into a new hive very readily if they're uh, physically in a close place, just sweep them off into the, into the hive, the waiting hive. Um, if a swarm has been out and has exhausted their supply of honey, it's called a dry swarm. And a dry swarm can be uh, very difficult to deal with because they are run out of food and they're kind of feisty and angry. And uh, so you always kind of want to, as you approach a swarm, get a sense of how protective they are. Um, bees prefer to go into places where bees have already been. Uh, that's why you see uh, bees nesting in, in homes for years upon years. Uh, and that's why you'll see them go back to certain trees. And you know, people think that there's always been bees in these trees, the same bees. Usually it's many successive generations of different colonies that have moved in and out and they smell the old honeycomb. It gives them a head start. It gives them a place to call home. Um, so they will, they will go back there. Uh, that becomes a problem in a building if it's there in your house, uh, because unless you get in there and clean all the honey and comb out and then firmly close up that opening, they will come back uh, again and cause the same kind of problem. So um, if you have bees in your home or another building, it's always best to call an experienced beekeeper who does removals, who will cut them out, clean out the hive uh, materials, and then seal it up so they won't, won't come back there. Because if you just seal it up 
and you don't kill off all the bees, they'll find other places uh, to go into in your home. And I know a, a family that did that they had someone come and do this and all of a sudden the bees were coming out of the, the uh, light sockets of the, in the upstairs bedrooms. They had found a, a way out and their upstairs was filled with bees. Uh, so that's a caution. Uh, so inside the hive, honeycomb is built of uh, the wax that the bees exude. Uh, the cells within the comb are hexagonal and they're uniform in size. Uh, honeycomb that's used to raise workers and drone broods are different sizes. Uh, that's the only real difference in, in any of the comb that you can see. The drone broods are slightly larger, uh, drone brood comb. And the, the worker bees is, is, is slightly smaller, uh, but honeycomb is a multi-purpose uh, substance because it's not only used for raising the uh, larvae of the, of the bees, but it's also used for storing uh, honey, uh, pollen, and uh, bee bread. Uh, the interior of a hive is normally about uh, four to six combs wide. You'll see in, in houses and such, uh, when we keep bees in, um, in, our, in our artificial hives, they tend to be, we do eight to 10 combs. That's why sometimes bees don't build out all the way to the edge. Uh, the bees organize their work in the interior of the hive uh, spatially. They work from the bottom up. So uh, they tend to have the brood chamber, you'll, you'll see, the typical Langstroth hive is two boxes and then supers that go up above that. The Langstroth hive in the bottom part is uh, where the bees will initially begin to raise their young and store up above. And then as they get more honey and more pollen that goes into the supers above that, the boxes are subsequently piled on top. Um, uh, so in the spring, one of the things you do is reverse the hive bodies so that they have empty space to work through. Because one of the things that they sense is uh, where they are sent close to the top. And when they get close to the top, they start to feel crowded and will, will swarm. Uh, but the, the food storage goes up above and they will keep adding food storage, honey and pollen uh, as time goes on. And that's where you stack up the supers, the boxes that go up on top. and um, the thing to keep, keep in mind about honeycomb is it's built with a slight upward angle so that uh, the honey doesn't flow outwards if, there's, uh, if it gets too warm. So, so one of the things that, you know, as you see bees in the field and one of the joys of keeping bees is to observe them. Uh, bees, honey bees are one of nature's most efficient pollinators. Uh, that's why they are so valued. Uh, and this is honeybees, not just Apis mellifera, which is a European honeybee, but uh, Apis dorsata, the Asian honeybee, and other subspecies that have evolved around the world. Uh, they can reach further into, into flowers for nectar, and there are flowers that have evolved uh, that can only be pollinated by honeybees. The classic example of that uh, efficiently are apples and almonds. Uh, apples will get cross-pollinated by the wind and by other insects, but if you ever see a mishapen apple where part of it's grown out larger than the other part, that's due to uh, inefficient pollination. Uh, a bee will go in there and uh, pollinate all the stamens uh, of the, of the uh, apple blossom, and therefore the, bee, the apple will develop in the full ramp. Uh, without that, it develops as kind of an a, a, a a mishapen thing. Almonds are um, almost entirely, in the U.S. as a cultivated crop, almost entirely pollinated by honeybees. Uh, nothing else has really been an effective uh, pollinator. And it's such that right now, even as we speak, uh, there are bee colonies being loaded up on semi-trailers uh, and being prepared to be moved to California starting in the first week or two of February uh, for the almond pollination. Uh, something like several million colonies of bees from across the United States head to California in February just to pollinate that one crop because they do not pollinate without that. Um, other structures on the bee's body that uh, are 
efficient for pollination is they carry pollen baskets. If you look close up at a bee as it's going into the hive, you'll often see a little yellow dot on one of the back legs. That is pollen that she has gathered and put into a ball and she has an opening uh, in the exoskeleton of one of her rear legs, um, actually on both of them on either side that she can put that in and she can carry that back to the hive. And also while she's rummaging around in these blossoms for pollen and nectar, she's pollinating the flowers, spreading the pollen from one to the other. Um, honeybees, you know, if you're using them for pollination for your garden uh, or for a farm crop, they uh, organize their, their, their gathering and uh, maintenance of, of, of pollination uh, in a systematic fashion. So they will receive reports from their scouts that there's a very strong apple blossom uh, grouping at a certain distance. They will decide as a collective to go there and they will work that crop primarily until it's gone. They may fly over dandelions or other um, flowers until they, until they exhaust that one crop. But they, they, they exhibit both species and area fidelity and they work things systematically, which is another reason why they're good pollinators. It's sometimes a cause of some frustration uh, for garden uh, pollinator. People are one of the gardens pollinated. I kept my bees for years at my mother-in-law's um, garden and she has a very spectacular blueberry bush uh, grouping. And uh, the bees one year just would not go to those blueberries until almost the end of the, the blossoms because they had discovered something else that they were working. And I couldn't explain why they would go, why they would ignore their beautiful blueberry blossoms and they were off in dandelions or somewhere else. Um, so again, bees have been with us for a long time. They've been in an environment for a long time. They are very important to uh, many crops that we have, but some of it has just been a factor of coevolution. I mentioned almonds, blueberries, apples. Uh, I think that the broccoli and other crops, um, these are very important uh, uh, pollinators. So when foragers go out, they collect nectar and they fly it in. It's, it's, each flight is worth, is, is equal to about 50% of their body weight. Uh, it takes about a thousand visits to individual blossoms to fill their crop before they go back. Uh, the average lifetime production of a honey per bee is one twelfth of a teaspoon. Uh, when they bring the nectar back, it's about 70 to 80 percent water. Uh, and they, uh, in their crop, they introduce um, enzymes and they start the process of um, winnowing it down, making it evaporate, concentrating it. And that's continued in the hive. They put the uh, the, the nectar into the honeycomb, the other bees uh, fanning and keeping air circulation going uh, will start to evaporate that because they need to get it down to about 18%, uh, at which point it's moisture, at which point it's stable. Prior to that, it will um, ferment uh, and it will tolerate, um, that the, will be a host for fungi and other contaminants. Uh, but once it gets down to its stable place where it's capped, honey uh, will last because it's a, a super saturated sugar for generations. You know, they found honey, you know, the, the classic line is they found honey in the, in the uh, pyramids. That was still good because it's a, it's, a, it's a super saturated sugar. Nothing will grow on it. And in fact, uh, honey is a uh, designated wound dressing by the World Health Organization for um, places that don't have access to um, the Western medical goods because uh, honey as a wound dressing, uh, the sugars absorb uh, moisture and germs and viruses can't live on it. So it's effective in, in, that, in that way. Um, so the honey itself, the, the product that you want uh, is, changes through the course of the season. Spring honey is different than summer honey. Summer honey is different than fall honey. 
Uh, if you are lucky and diligent enough, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next session when hopefully I'll have pictures. Um, you can capture varietal honeys. Uh, these are honeys of specific blossoms. It's hard here in the Northeast to um, get varietals because our, our season is compressed. In a place like Florida or Georgia, where you have a very long blossom season, you'll go from orange blossoms, there'll be a break or a dearth of a couple of weeks, and then there'll be other flowering things. Uh, here, everything comes in at once in a very short period of time. So, um, you know, I always try to get basswood and locust uh, honey, and I've gotten it about one in 10 years uh, because it has a blossom span of about 10 days in late May or early June, both of those trees. Uh, but they produce a very fine water white honey with a very nice uh, subtle flavor. Um, but in your first few years, you don't have to worry about that. You're just going to gather what's called wildflower honey, which is whatever the bees bring in. And uh, you'll find that it's superior to anything you can get in, in, in the store. So um, you're not going to worry about that. But uh, wildflower honey, uh, again, through the course of season, much like maple syrup, when it starts, it's lighter. Mid-season, it gets darker, goes from A, grade A to grade B. And then the last honey is quite dark. And the last maple syrup is quite dark with a very rich flavor, sometimes say a strong flavor. Uh, the same thing is true, true of honey. It goes from light to dark through the course of the season. It becomes thicker and heavier. Uh, and I don't know if there's something in nature that judges that or it's just a coincidence. Uh, pollen's another uh, product uh, of the hive. Uh, it provides the bees um, protein. The honey is the carbohydrates. Uh, the pollen's about 35% protein, some sugars and enzymes, minerals, vitamins. It's a very rich food source for them. Uh, people take it uh, for health purposes here, and you can gather it uh, using a honey a pollen trap at the entrance to your hive. Very simple device that as the bees go through, it scrapes off the, the um, pollen into, a, into a, a basket and you pull that off and you don't leave the trap on all season or you'll starve your bees, but you keep it on for a week or so uh, during the course of uh, the summer. And that usually provides a sufficient amount for your, your personal use. Um, beeswax is actually in historical times, beeswax was the most important product of the hive. Beeswax was very valuable and it was used in Egyptian times and um, in, the, in the early Mideast uh, for not just candles, but artwork, encaustic artwork. Uh, some of the uh, paintings that you see in um, Egyptian tombs and such is encaustic, which is used with uh, beeswax. Uh, it was also used uh, for mortuary, for preserving those mummies. And during Roman times, it was uh, a primary form of, of currency. Uh, today, it's still used. Uh, Russian Orthodox churches and Catholic churches use beeswax candles uh, in preference over other kinds. Um, it's a much higher quality, longer lasting candle. And they're still used in jewelry production uh, for the lost wax process and others. So let's talk about actually uh, keeping bees. So some things you need to think about in terms of keeping bees are oops, uh, space. How much space do you have? What your time constraints are, uh, the financial commitment, uh, desired outcomes, what you wanna do with it. Are you using it for pollination purposes or for um, honey production and um, a philosophy that I find that beekeeping, there's a lot of different philosophies that are, are present. Um, I won't go into them in any depth, but um, one thing you'll, you'll learn as, as time goes on, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, is uh, that bees are suffering from several different uh, diseases and maladies. And um, like gardening, it's very analogous to gardening. There are those who want to treat things entirely organically. Uh, there are those that want to treat them with whatever modern technology can address the issue. And there are those in the middle who, who follow what um, you know, Cornell calls an IPM, Integrated Pest Management Approach, which is the minimal use of chemicals, 
uh, and effective you know, strategies to deal with, with, um, with these various maladies. Um, and it's important you'll find for yourself to follow one of these or the other. And that's really a personal judgment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And the final thing is bee stings. You will get stung. Uh, you should know whether you're allergic or not to bee stings. You can find out just by hanging around a, a bee yard or you can ask your doctor. Uh, but it is important to, uh, to know that. And if you have any slight allergies to make sure you have an EpiPen around. Um, talk a little bit about that. So uh, what does it cost to, to begin beekeeping? Uh, essentially between six and $1,200. Uh, I and most bee folk recommend you start out not with one hive, but at least two, maybe three. The reason for that is that if something happens to the one hive, you're out of luck for the entire season. You buy bees early in the year, like right now, you order them, you get them, and if something happens in July or August, they swarm and the, survive, the bees remaining die off, you've just invested a whole lot of things for no return. Whereas if you have two hives or three hives, you can uh, recharge those bees. You can focus your efforts on the remaining hives. Um, but really, I, I do encourage you to plan on uh, at least two hives. Um, there are various uh, tools, smokers, hive tools, uh, protective clothing, et cetera. Um, recommend strongly get involved with the bee club um, there are several at the end slide of this uh, that will, um, you know, they do introductory bee courses, so you can see exactly what you need. You can also go to the catalogs, and they have beginner outfits that are, um, you know, complete. They have hives and, you know, a protective veil and jacket and gloves, etc. cetera. Uh, one important thing to say is, you know, we all like a bargain. Uh, it's really not a good idea to buy any equipment that touches bees used. There are so many bee diseases that are uh, spread by um, contact with a used bee comb, honey bee comb, uh, and perhaps you know uh, were subject to, or exposed to chemicals. Um, so it's really not a good idea to use bee, used bee equipment. It used to be encouraged as a cost-saving manner, but uh, now it's really strongly discouraged. In fact, one of the things that you would focus on as you keep bees is uh, rotating your stock of equipment, that the internal parts, the frames and foundations should be switched out at least uh, every three to four years, no longer uh, than that. Whereas in the past, there, you know, it was thought that bees were attracted to older comb and would um, stay there more frequently. Uh, now we switch it out just for health purposes. So space needs. This was a beautiful picture of a field and, <laughs> and a fencing and apiary. Uh, you need to have a place where you can uh, keep bees. Uh, they're, they're not going to be disturbed. Um, you don't need a huge area. I kept bees in uh, a downtown home I had once in Burlington, Vermont, and no one knew the wiser. Um, but they need to have um, the in full sun facing uh, sunny location, not, you know, uh, open shade is okay, but not deep shade. Uh, you want to think about the winter and how they're going to get through the winter. So a natural windbreak is really good. So if you can put them, you know, uh, up against the side of a barn or uh, behind a hedge, um, They'll need to have a source of water available. You don't need to feed them great amounts of water, but unless you have, um, you know, if you don't have a wet yard or something, you should think about uh, providing some bit of water. Uh, if you have uh, neighbors who use pesticides, you should be careful uh, because bees will not only die out in the field with pesticide, but they'll also bring pesticides back into the hive. So you should be aware of what potential pesticide use is happening in your neighborhood. Uh, you should think about, uh, because bee equipment is heavy when it's full of honey, those supers weigh 90 to 100 pounds, a full super. Uh, 
Uh, you should think of a place that's convenient access for loading and unloading. So you can drive a car, if not a car, uh, a wheelbarrow, a garden way car that you can get to easily to move things in and out. Uh, it will be much easier in the long run. I've worked with folks who found a beautiful place to keep bees up on a hill. It was a devil to get to and um, the bees liked it, but keeping bees was very, very difficult there. Uh, if you're keeping in a, uh, in a village or suburban neighborhood, you wanna be a good neighbor. So you wanna ask, uh, talk to your neighbors about this. Uh, you wanna be aware of what's happening with the bees um, so that they don't uh, get upset. Usually most people are understanding and actually supportive, uh, but uh, you wanna make sure that that's not gonna be an issue. Um, finally, a couple of things. Uh, you wanna keep kids away from, from hives. Uh, my daughter as a young child wandered into the bee line and got stung twice. She's okay about it now, some 20 years later, but for years she was not happy with being anywhere near bees. Uh, so you don't wanna form a negative uh, a reaction. Uh, bees often identify dogs, confuse dogs and bears, particularly German shepherds and dogs that look like shepherdy and will sting them. So, um, be careful to you know, keep, keep it around a fence. Uh, and unfortunately in today's world, uh, you wanna make it, if you have an outlying bee yard and a piece of property that's not near your home, make sure it's not visible uh, from the road uh, so that it doesn't uh, become a target of thieves or vandals. For safety, uh, protective clothing. I like, a, there's a, you can buy a bee jacket that has a simple veil over it, um, or you can buy a hat with a veil uh, whatever is your 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 preference, uh, gloves. I try to work without gloves because it reduces the touch so much that uh, it actually becomes more of a problem. But you want gloves that are sting proof, uh, a smoker, an EpiPen if you need it. Um, if you keep bees in any kind of public place, like a public garden, when you're working with bees, you want to establish the safety zone because sometimes people wander right up and stare at you as you're working with bees and um, get themselves stung. So where do you get bees? A couple of different, few different sources. Uh, there are uh, bee equipment dealers uh, close to us in this part of the world is uh, Q-Tix Honey outside of Norwich. Uh, Better Bee, which is uh, east of Saratoga Springs, and even some local beekeepers or bee clubs. John McCoy outside of Oneonta uh, sells nukes. Uh, and bees come in two different forms when you buy purchase them. Either a package, which is in essence an artificial swarm, and those are shipped up from Georgia and Alabama and the south. And they come in three or five pound packages. And uh, those are... Um, shaken out into the hive, the queen is introduced and they kind of take to it as much as a swarm would. The other form of bees that, uh, that are for sale are uh, nukes, nuke colonies or nucleus colonies. That's uh, three or four frames uh, often wintered over. So they've survived the winter, so they're winter survivors. Uh, a package of bees costs about $125. A nuke will cost about 200 or more. And the advantage of a nuke is that it's kind of started uh, already. So it's got a head start on the season. Whereas the package bees have to start from kind of square one. Um, you can also get bees uh, as you become more efficient or practiced uh, by swarms, capturing swarms. So you should always have spare equipment uh, once you've been in the doing it for a couple of years, because you will get calls from friends and neighbors saying, hey, there's more bees in my backyard, do you want them? Uh, or if you're a talented woodworker or carpenter, you can do cutouts. Um, they're, they're always in demand, uh, but you need to be able to put someone's house back together once you cut out part of it to uh, get the bees. So uh, that's a special skill. So we're just gonna walk through the uh, cycle of the year. Uh, in the spring, uh, you'll wanna check over your winter colonies, make sure they've survived. Um, the last few years, because of all the bee diseases, if you have a 50% survival rate, you're doing really well. Um, sometimes it's been very, very high. Uh, in, if necessary, in the spring, and let's say March, you wanna check them. If they're light, 
this is a dangerous time for them, so you might want to feed them. And feeding them is simply creating a sugar water mix, about 50% uh, hot water and 50% sugar and by volume. Stir it up until it, it melts, and then there are feeders that you can buy that will be can be fed directly to them. Uh, you can also just sprinkle granulated sugar on top of the hive bars uh, to, to get them going. Uh, and then you want to also keep an eye on uh, the bees as to when the bloom cycle comes in. Uh, I always follow the dandelions. When the dandelions are blooming in May, you don't have to, once they're there, they've kind of made it. Uh, there are earlier like pussy willow and uh, some maple trees that are blooming earlier and you will see them bring in um, pollen when there's no leaves on the tree. I still don't know where they get it, uh, but that's when they're starting. But that isn't really sufficient to carry them. Once, they, once you hit dandelion season, they're kind of off and running. You don't have to worry about feeding from that point. Uh, summer, you want to monitor the blooms as they come in and in and out, uh, keeping a diary is really helpful because you can then know how well they're doing and what the child, what the, the bloom cycle is in your particular neighbor. Uh, you check in on your hives. I just like to look at the entrance. You see a lot of, you learn a lot from the entrance. You wanna check the brood patterns. You'll know by looking at the internal uh, pictures of the, of, the, of the hive as to how the queen is laying and how things are going. And then the supers being filled, um, and you want to pull them off as they fill so they don't get too crowded and replace them with empties. Uh, in terms of working with the bees, uh, working on sunny days is always safer than cloudy, rainy days. Bees are like humans, they like warm weather. Uh, you approach and work from the back and the side so you're not in their way. Uh, and uh, don't block the and work quickly and calmly. And this is a practice thing because when you're working with 10,000 stinging insects, sometimes it's a little bit uh, nerve wracking, uh, but they can tell your temperature. And uh, if, you're in a, if you're fearful, they're gonna pick up on that. So um, you also have to monitor for external pests. Uh, external pests are uh, in our neighborhood, bears. Uh, bears are a primary uh, problem of bees, they will come in and they will wipe out an apiary in a night or two. And once they know that the bees are there, they will come back. So if you have bears in your neighborhood, you'll have to come up with an electric fence or something to keep them out. Uh, other pests that are external are um, skunks. Skunks like to eat the bees themselves and they will knock on a hive and, um, you know, as the bees come out to protect, they will catch the bees and eat them. Uh, and they'll deplete a hive to the point where uh, it endangers its survival. More importantly, uh, and this is a good reason to belong to a bee club, uh, is that there are various uh, pests and diseases that now are, uh, in the last 30 years, have just become you know, predominant in terms of managing bees. Varora is a, a mite, a tiny mite that came from Central Asia, and due to world travel and trade uh, has become endemic almost throughout the entire world. I think New Zealand and maybe some islands off the coast of Australia are the only places where it isn't. Uh, it will kill off a colony. It introduces viruses that kill off a colony. Uh, there are methods to manage it, which um, you would need to, you need to kind of educate your own self on. Various foul broods, nozema, hive beetles, each one requires a specific strategy. Uh, finally, you get to the fall, and you want to make sure you're going to plan on harvesting the honey. So you have those supers that are atop the, the two hive bodies. Uh, you want to leave enough for the honey bees to get through the winter. About 70 to 90 pounds uh, need to stay in the hive. Uh, you want to check to make sure the bees have not moved up into those uh, honey supers. Uh, and then you separate the bees from the supers either by uh, blowing them out with a leaf blower, some people do, or there is a baffle that you can put between the two levels that the bees will go down to in the night and then they can't get back up. Uh, and then uh, you do the extraction. Extraction um, is the spinning out of the, 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 the um, honey and that you either have to buy the equipment for, which is another kind of big expense, 
or often within clubs, they purchase an extractor and you share it and do, it, do joint harvesting. I've done that in the past. Uh, recently, um, extracting equipment has become available on Amazon from Chinese manufacturers. It's very reasonable compared to what it was and it seems to be pr pretty functional. So that's, that's become a new option. Uh, so winter needs, uh, in this part of the world, uh, you wanna make sure that your um, bees are sheltered from prevailing winds. Um, if they have ventilation, uh, that they can, that if you keep an eye on the hive and there's a large snow uh, load, you shovel out around the hive. Uh, you will see if you walk up to a hive in the winter, often the, the snow is melted from around it. That's the heat of the hive uh, that's melting that. And uh, that will, you know, but you want to make sure that they have good, good air, access to air. And um, you can check on hives in the winter uh, through on a, on a warm day. If it gets up to 45 degrees, it's okay to open the top of the hive and look in so that if you need to feed them or uh, do another emergency measure, you can. Okay. And then you want to come. Wonderful. Hey. Oh, are you ready to take questions, Garrett? Yes. And I oh. apologize again for the lack of images, but. You know what? You paint a picture. Uh, I tried. Without the images. So uh, it was very well delivered. And um, so thoughts about horizontal hives versus vertical hives. So horizontal hives are called a top bar hive. And a top bar hive uh, is a kind of a new development in the beekeeping world that goes on traditional African hives. It looks like a small coffin. It's in those proportions. Uh, the advantages to the horizontal uh, top bar hive is that the bees are always producing fresh comb. There's no comb that's carried over. So that's, uh, that's healthier for them. Uh, the disadvantage is, is that it's really hard to produce much of a, a honey crop. You're not gonna get you know, a typical hive, you can get easily 75 pounds of honey on a horizontal top bar hive. You're gonna get 40 or 50 pounds maximum. It's hard to get beyond that. Great. And then the so, next, oh, go ahead. So yeah, so if you're more interested in, I would say if you're more interested in pollination and honeybee health, that you would do the side top bar hive. If you were interested in, in Keeping bees for production, you would go with the standard Langstroth uh, vertical hive. Excellent. Okay, so the next question is what's the recommended electric sense setup to deter bears? Number of lines, voltage, any recommended companies? So, um, yeah, I, what I've used, which seemed to be effective is your standard uh, fence charger that you get to run a, a fence for uh, livestock uh, with three lines. Um, usually they're, you know, they, you can get them powerful enough and you're not gonna be fencing a huge area they carry quite a zap. Um, and uh, the recommendation also is uh, hang bacon or other meat product on the line. So the bees, the bears will go up and bite the, you know, take that off and get a zap and that will keep them away. Um, and really that's, that's about as bad, they're, 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 once they get into uh, an apiary, it's really hard to keep them out. And if they, know the, if they know the bees are in there, they'll often walk through an electric fence. So uh, bees, uh, bears are a tremendous challenge with bees. We had a conversation the other day about skunks. Can you uh, fill folks in on that? That was uh, pretty funny. Okay. Yeah, skunks as a, skunks will eat skunks eat bees, and they and raccoons to a lesser degree also eat bees. So they look at beehives as kind of a vending machine, and they will come up and they will revisit a hive night after night, bang on the hive. The bees come out, they eat them, uh, and uh, they deplete the population and can actually kill off an entire hive through that. Uh, so if you have a, if you have a an apiary and you notice the bees have suddenly changed mood and suddenly they're more grouchy than they were. Sometimes it's the queen and you need to requeen because it's a genetic behavior. And sometimes it's because something, you know, I had yellow jackets that were attacking them. 
So look at your hives for clues. If, it, if you have skunk issues, there'll be scratches on the outside of the hive from where the, the skunk has been uh, getting at them. Okay, and one more question. Um, have you heard of the flow hive uh, with the spigots? What are your thoughts yes. on that setup? So the flow hive was invented in Australia as a way of beekeeping without necessarily going into the hive. And what it does is it has the conventional chambers and then uh, supers that sit above it and a crank that somehow, and I'm not sure exactly the internal workings, compresses the, the comb so that the, the honey then flows out so you can harvest honey without opening the hive. Uh, I've had no direct experience. I know that for me, uh, one of the most important parts of beekeeping is to, to keep a, uh, an internal check on bee health. And you can only really do that by looking at the comb and looking at uh, where the bees are internally. So uh, I'm not tempted to use, uh, use that, that particular uh, style of hive. Okay, and another question about allergies actually. Um, so this uh, person is interested in beekeeping, but very inflammatory reactions in the past, no anaphylaxis, is it, do you decrease the sensitivity over time the more you work with bees and being stung or is that something that should be of concern? Well, an allergic reaction is always a concern. You should check with a physician. I can tell you that um, I've been stung many hundreds of times and that you do reduce your reaction. Certain parts of your body are more sensitive and it appears it's an allergic reaction when it's just a normal reaction. For example, um, Sometimes when I approach a hive and it's, it's in a bad mood and bees have moods, I, I have once been stung. I could see a bee coming at me like a heat seeking missile and it hit me right between the eyes here uh, and my whole face blew up. And it wasn't really an, alert, an extraordinary allergic reaction, it was simply the reaction to that particular sting. A normal reaction to a bee sting is swelling, itching um, uh, and redness. And uh, depending upon the part of your body, uh, it will be, there's certain parts of your body like your head and sometimes your hands, which are have more soft tissue where it will become more inflamed. Um, so it's something to, to check in on. Um, and you know, if you have any concerns, carry an EpiPen uh, and some uh, uh, decongestant uh, antihistamine. So on that note, um, we're a few minutes away from the next session, but I'd like to invite Wendy, actually, who is our beekeeper here at, uh, in Delaware County. Uh, she's being trained through the um, Master Beekeeping Program at the Dice Lab. Uh, she can um, tell you about beekeeping opportunities at Birdsong Farm Community Garden. Are you here, Wendy? And if not, um, I'll just. Okay, I think I oh, unmuted. There she is. I, I knew she was here. <laughs> Hi, Wendy. Hi. Very nice uh, presentation, Garrett. Um, Thank you. Always interested in hearing and rehearing anything any beekeeper has to say. Um, we had a very good year at Birdsong. We need lots more volunteers in Delaware County. Um, we started with 11 hives from brand new nukes and we got over 300 pounds of honey the first year, which was amazing. Um, we ended up trying to overwinter nine hives. I had to combine a few because they were queenless, I believe they had late swarming. And we checked them in December when I was back, I live in Ohio. So we were back in December and they were all still alive, but we hadn't had this cold snap yet and actually the warm snap was worse for the bees because they're eating all their resources. <laughs> but uh, I tend, we intend to go back in the next couple of weeks and we'll check them again. But hopefully we can get some to overwinter. And I'd really like some interested people to join us if they like. Um, it's very, very interesting Eddie, to me. You, I'm very- uh, Drop your email address in the comment box. Um, okay. So that folks in Delaware County or near Delaware County, if they're willing to drive, maybe once a week, come out to Birdsong Farm Community Garden, and um, Wendy has taught so, what was it, two or three people last year 
who had no I mean, I have a couple more interested, so that's great news. Well, even last year, you had Georgia and a few other folks suited up. I did, yes. And and towards the end of the year, I had a few more and told them we definitely want their help in the spring. And they never thought they could be beekeepers or that this was out of their reach, but just to get the contact with you and the hands-on, they really, really learned it. So, um, yeah, so Wendy's going to put uh, her email address in the comment box and you can reach out to her. We are, I think, in, for now thinking there will be some time during the day on Wednesdays, right, Wendy? Yes, that, that would be a good day. Depending yeah. on weather, of course, that's always a iffy factor, but we can yeah, still so have discussions for sure on Wednesday, whether it rains or shines. So. so for those of you who aren't familiar with Birdsong Farm Community Garden, we run volunteer uh, gardening sessions throughout the week. And um, we figured out that it's not a good idea to deal with bees and vegetables on the same day, because uh, if the bees are in a bad mood, people are going to get stung. So, um, well, I, my experience with those bees at the yard is they were kind of aggressive bees. My, my bees in my yard were much, much nicer. So hopefully we can requeen some next year and get some gentler bees. But yes. But anyways, we will set Wednesday aside for you bee people and you guys can work together on um, the time of day and how you want to arrange the session. So with that, I think, um, Dale, how are we looking on time? I think that um, we can take a brief break, maybe two minutes okay. All right. or and then so, and then start the next session. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you, Garrett. And um, if you want to try to send me the next set of slides for me to show from here, we can try that. And if not, I thought what you did just now was fine. Yeah, I think that the new the next set of slides is in a different template, so it should be okay. Awesome. And we'll try to post the, the corrected PowerPoint up on the website so you can have access, the participants can have access to it in the future. Excellent. Thank you so yes, much, we, Garrett. We, we appreciate it. Yes. Yes.